Hi there, I'm Dr. Jill Wiener. I am a specialist in physician wellness uh, using tapping and meditation. And I am an avid um, lifelong learner in all ways, and in particular, learning more about anti-racism and, and the ways that uh, racist, racism has um, been a systemic issue in our country for centuries and how we can um, start to heal from that and move forward and, and dismantle it. And I've been doing a series of interviews during COVID with several amazing people to talk about health disparities, social disparities that have been present, shedding light on that, that have been here before COVID and that are now being really magnified by COVID. And I'm so excited today. This is a little bit of a departure from my normal people that I've been interviewed, but I have LaShira Nolan, who is a first year med student at Harvard. And if that's not cool enough, I remember the day that I got my rejection from Harvard Med School and I framed that because I was like, I got to a point in my life where I got rejected by Harvard. That says so. They're lost. They're lost. <laughs> um, but she's also the, the class president of her class and the first black woman president, which I feel like one day that shouldn't have to be a qualifier, but I think it's pretty rad that it is. Um, so congratulations on all that you have um, achieved and, and, and done in um, in your life so far. Uh, Lashira, can you tell us a little bit about you and, and um, wh where you've been up until now? And, and you're, you're an activist, and I'd love to hear a little bit more about your activist work. Yeah, so first, thank you so much for having me on the, on the podcast, Jill, and, or, the, or the show. <laughs> and so it's like a little, like a pseudo, a little bit of everything. Yeah, we're not sure what, is, what it is yet. It's a series of interviews, but yes, it is, it, it is a show. I love it. Yeah. So I'm, I'm very excited to be here and to chat with you. And uh, my name is LaShira Nolan, but all my friends call me Lash or most folks know me as Lash. And I am originally from Los Angeles, California. I uh, grew up in Compton, raised by a single mother, raised by some phenomenal women in my life. And they are the reason why I am today. And I was the first person in my family to uh, pursue a career in medicine. And my mom was the first in our family to get her bachelor's and master's degree. So she was always kind of like this huge inspiration in my life. And she was the person that I was always falling behind. Like I can do this, anything is possible. Um, and, and that's why I decided to pursue this crazy dream of medicine, even though there were no people in my periphery who were doing anything related to medicine, or I didn't have any doctors in my family or in my community that looked like me. Um, so, so here we are now. Um, I went to Loyola Marymount University, which is also located in Los Angeles, had an amazing time there, uh, was involved in student government there, was a student body president, and also used that role for advocacy. And ever since I was in elementary school, I've been involved with student government. I've always been president because I've always seen it as this vehicle for change that sometimes folks don't know to take advantage of because they assume the student government is this thing that you do for rallies and concerts, but I've always seen it as an opportunity to get more proximal to leaders and decision makers at an institution and really bring up important things. And in fifth grade, it was, we need to repaint the lines on the basketball courts. And then it became making sure that we invite communities in our periphery into spaces like Loyola Marymount University and Harvard Medical School. So advocacy has, has always been at the forefront of everything that I've done. And beyond that, I decided to take uh, two gap years after my time at Loyola Marymount University. And the first year I spent in Spain as a Fulbright scholar. So I was in Galicia, which is the northwestern province of Spain, um, where they speak Galician, which is a mix of Castilian, Spanish, and Portuguese. And it was such a lovely experience because I had never known anything about Galicia or Galician or their cuisine. And my students didn't really know much about Black culture. So I was really able to go there and show them that these exported images of who Black people are and what we do in the US is not necessarily ubiquitous and it's not always correct. And I was able to teach them about Black History Month and social determinants of health and topics like domestic violence. And I was really just trying to get them to understand the importance of social justice and advocacy and their role that they can play in that. And it was so cool because at the end of my time teaching, we actually came together and we did this amazing uh, fundraiser in March for women who were immigrants and also survivors of domestic violence. And it was so cool to see them involved. Like my students, they made the t-shirt that we use for the event and all that good stuff. And that was such a beautiful moment. And 
Beyond that, I also did some, some public health research looking at the perceptions of diabetes um, amongst adolescents in Galicia, and that was really cool too. And from that experience, I gained full fluency in Spanish, and I then went on to go to Chicago. I, that's why I was excited oh, when you told me you were rushed. Yeah, I was uh, living in Bronzeville, actually. So I was on the South Side, and I was working in Albany Park, which is um, heralded as one of the most diverse zip codes in all of Chicago. And most of my patients were Spanish speaking, about maybe 85, 90% of them. And I was doing health education at a clinic there as an AmeriCorps member, um, doing a year of service. And I was doing motivational interviewing and really just working with patients to improve their health by censoring their concerns um, as, as the forefront of the visit and learn really valuable skills. And I think also, I, since I lived on the South Side and I worked on the North Side of Chicago, I would have this hour, 15 minute commute every day, you know, to an hour and back another hour. And I spent a lot of that time doing a lot of reading. So I was reading about our healthcare system. Um, I was reading The Warmth of Other Suns um, by Isabel Wilkerson, learning about the Great Migration. And being in Chicago was so cool to learn about the Great Migration. And I was also learning about why Chicago was so segregated. And I, I read the, the Color of Law by Richard Rothstein and just so many amazing books. And I was also seeing everything that I was reading playing right out in front of me because every time I went from the South Side to the North Side, I saw the demographics of the train completely shift every time we hit Roosevelt. And from Roosevelt on, most folks did not look like me. But then on the way back, when we left Roosevelt, most folks did look like me. They were mostly um, Black people, Latinx people, people of color. Um, and I just found that so interesting. And it was, it was so profound to have that experience on the train, reading these books, seeing these demographic shift, and then going and, and serving patients and seeing that a lot of what I was able to provide them was limited by their experiences outside of the clinic. So even if I was able to give them health education and to tell them what they should be eating, if they didn't have access to healthy food, or if they lived in a space where they didn't feel it was safe to go exercise, then how was I supposed to just expect them to do those things when our society has already felt them and hasn't given them that safety net that they need to live healthy, joyous lives that they deserve to. So that is what really got me interested in advocacy on the public policy level. At first, I was really interested in public health, which I still am. And I think public health is so key and important. It's everything. Um, but I think that public policy is my way of changing the rules of society. And I think public health helps us understand where those inequities lie. Um, so that's kind of the space that I came into medical school with. And ever since then, I've kind of had this keen eye for injustice. I'm always looking to figure out, you know, which skin types aren't being shown on PowerPoint presentations, what assumptions are we making and the questions that we ask and the, and the way that we present certain patients and things of that sort. So I think that that has really led me to become this activist on Twitter and at school and you know in the community. And it's been a really amazing journey and I'm excited to, to continue to grow in that, in that aspect. That's awesome. I love how it kind of unfolded for you. I, I was reading in one of your interviews, um, it sounds like on your on your train rides you were learning but right. you also mentioned that you had to unlearn something so i told you i was going to ask this question but i don't actually know <laughs> what your answer is going to be so i'm so curious to hear what what did you have to unlearn about systemic racism um in order to get to where you are now yeah i mean i think that the biggest thing that i had to learn is like growing up in a place like Compton, right? And, and not necessarily understanding the historical context in which the city exists currently. It's easy to, to feel like everything is your fault. It's easy to feel like, oh, this is the reason why we have so many potholes, or this is the reason why the streets look like this. This is the reason why there are so many empty buildings and vacant lots. And when I say this is the reason, you start to feel like you are the reason. And you as that, an individual or you as a, a black woman or you as what? I feel like it's, and I don't want to speak for my entire community, but I'll, I'll say like it's easy for black youth growing up in their communities to feel like the conditions of their community is because their people have done something wrong or 
inherently this is the way that things are supposed to be. So it's easy to start to accept that this is how the condition of your life is supposed to be. And this is just the natural order of things. And I think that it takes a lot of unlearning to disrupt that. Because if you're constantly getting lesser than and you know, you're know you bearing the brunt of, of the worst that our society has to offer, it's easy to internalize that. And I think that that was a lot of the unlearning that I had to do in learning history and learning that there was white flight and, and learning what you know urban neighborhoods or inner city, what, what, what do all those loaded terms mean? And the more that you read about these things, you learn like, oh, okay, there, there were policies that were developed. And this is why so many of my classmates had asthma growing up. And, you know, it's not, this is not the way that things are supposed to be. And it's like systematically designed in such a way. Mm -hmm. And I think also going into a space like Harvard Medical School, it's easy to feel inadequate, especially as a person of color who doesn't necessarily have the resources that everyone else might have in the sense that you might not necessarily always see people that look like you and it's easy to feel this I, this stereotype threat like every time you speak in class you're representing your entire race and if you say something wrong then that's going to be a direct reflection of the intelligence of your entire people and just all of those different types of things and feeling like is this space made for me should i be here mm -hmm. um this idea of imposter syndrome and i think that through learning about history learning about his, the history of the United States, but then also Black history, I learned how much power there is in my people and how much strength there is in my existence in these spaces. Because so much of what the U.S. and America is, is because of what Black people were. And I think now when I'm in these spaces, I don't feel discomfort as much as I used to because I'm so proud to to be here because I know how much it took for me to be here. Mm -hmm. uh, and I know how much of an input my ancestors had in making these spaces exist. Um, whether that be willingly or forced, they did it and they deserve to be celebrated. And I feel like my existence in these spaces is a celebration of that. That's so beautiful. And that's like a long, I mean, that's like an identity crisis almost to some extent having to like reverse. I don't know. You're probably, I'm assuming you're in your twenties in some part of your twenties right now, like to reverse 20 plus years of conditioning in our society. Um, that's a lot to undertake and pretty incredible that you've already been able to, to do that because it's, it's so enmeshed in our society that we don't even, realize it you know and it doesn't just it's not just making white people have biases it, it can also from, from what you're saying and from what i'm understanding from, from talking to other people it can really affect the way you see yourself um as a, as a black person does that sound does that resonate yeah like i mean i don't know if i would call it an identity crisis i think it was a, like a like an awakening almost i kind of sure. feel like i've been like yeah. you know living like, you know, I think uh, W.E.B. Du Bois, he said that we're living like in this veil, like we always have this veil where you, you see the world through the eyes of, you know, a, a person of like a black person, but then it's, it's just an interesting experience because you have like this dual reality. And I think in that moment, I realized why that dual reality existed and how it's not inherently my fault or my yeah. family's fault that these are the conditions that we had to live and escape from. Um, and, and I think that's really what it, what it was. And, and I, I 100% is so enmeshed in our society that you don't even realize how wrong it is. Yeah. I like that. An awakening. Thank you for like clarifying my words. Cause I, I, yeah. I do my best, but I, I certainly, um, don't have, don't have the same life experience and I don't know how to describe everything perfectly. So yeah. So an awakening, that's so beautiful. That's so, so much more profound too. So, um, you mentioned stereotype threat. Um, and I've read, I believe, the, the book where I, where I first learned about that. Um, the Whistling Vivaldi? Vivaldi. Is, that, yeah. is that a term? Because I, I don't think I've heard people use that conversationally. Can you talk a little bit about what that is and, and um, what your experience of that is? Yeah. Knowing so, what it is academically and then like living it. And how it manifests, right? Yeah. 
Yeah, so the way that I think about stereotype threat is it is this fear that you are going to confirm stereotypes about yourself and the group for which you represent. Mm -hmm. um, so in, in my case, it would be I am Black and I'm a woman. So when I'm in an academic setting and I say something or I answer a question, it's a fear that if I don't get that question right, or if I say something that might not be perceived as intelligent, then that means that everybody that I'm representing is getting the question wrong and is not seen as intelligent. So it's kind of like this pressure to overperform, but it causes you to not perform as well as you're capable of because you're afraid of confirming these stereotypes. That's perfect. Yeah, that like sums up perfectly what the whole book was about. And it's not just about race it's about gender and it's about and it's not just about black versus white it's all all sort you know they had i think they did studies on asian asian students and their math tests and there was this pressure to like conform to that stereotype so it's it's really a, a really cool concept and so you're you're you sounds like you're acutely aware of it living yeah living. yeah I, and that's the thing I've, I've been trying to become more aware of these things so that when it, when it manifests in, in the moment, I'm like, okay, what's, what is that? Why don't I wanna answer this question? Why do I feel weird about this? Why do I feel bad about getting this wrong? Um, Cause I think that the more easy it is to recognize it, you can kind of stop that from happening regularly. So yeah. Um, that's, cause my, my understanding what it was, it was, it was a more like subconscious thing, but it's really interesting to hear you talk about your awareness of it. Um, and maybe you've, you've been, that's how you've been able to conquer it is by, by learning about it and then recognizing it and then dismantling it a little bit within yourself. Does that sound? Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's, that's, that's a lot. It's a lot to take on. And it's impressive that, that you, that you've been able to do that. What does anti-racism mean to you? So when you talk, when, when you hear that term or when you're, when you're teaching people what it's about, what, what does that, because a lot of people don't understand what it means um and they hear the term and they're kind of like ah, i'm not racist they don't quite understand so what's <laughs> your um what does it mean to you yeah so for me anti-racism means that you are actively fighting against racism and i think that traditionally there's been this dichotomy when it when the conversation is about racism where bad people are racist and good people are not. And that simply is not always true. There are some folks out there who are racist and bad people, but there are people out there who are good people and are also racist. And for me, the way that I define racism is it's a, it's a power structure. It's, it's about who has access to decision-making power and opportunities and who benefits from that power at the expense of those who don't have access to that. So I think that some folks might think of anti-racism as making, making sure that uh, there's a wide amount of diversity on a, a panel or in an organization. And that's great because, you know, we have this representation, but I think that anti-racism would be taking it a step further to make sure that whoever that individual is there who is considered a minority or is considered to traditionally underrepresented in this space feels like they have a voice feels comfortable mm -hmm. feels like their concerns are going to be heard feels like they have opportunities for upward mobility and ensuring that person's success because you might think that it's anti-racist to just have them there but if that individual isn't able to reach their full potential and to grow as an individual and to have the same opportunities as those who are a part of the majority, then you're not quite there yet when it comes to doing the work. So I think that anti-racism is, it's an active muscle that you have to flex. It's not like enough to just be, you know, I love everyone, I don't see color. That's not, that's not quite enough. Like I'm happy that, that you know, you feel that way and that's cool and I'm happy for you, but it's not enough. Right. Yeah. Right. And that's one thing that I've learned is, is like <sighs> pretending that you don't have bias that has been ingrained in you for your whole life, pretending that you don't have that doesn't make you a better person. And it doesn't mean that you're not 
part of the system that's perpetuating power for white people and, and keeping other people marginalized. So, and acknowledging that you have it doesn't mean you're a bad person. It actually is a sign right. of growth and it's a sign of like, yeah, well, of course I'm going to have that thought because every like image in the news and, 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 you know, everything in this that we see and hear is selected right. subconsciously or consciously, but it's selected to, to keep certain views of, of different races in this country. Is, is that something that, uh, that you agree with? I mean, yeah. I that's that's something I was trying to trap you. I didn't mean it like that. No, 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 not at all. Not at all a trap, but, but yeah. Um, and, and you're so right that things are selected in a way that is definitely telling that this group is considered the norm. Mm -hmm. And I think a perfect example of this is Band-Aids, right? You go to get a Band-Aid and all the Band-Aids are tan. And it isn't until you think about the kid Band-Aids where you actually see deviance from this. And those are seen as like fun, you know, you want them to stand out. but I remember seeing a tweet where there was a black man who was so excited. He, he was literally, he said, I was in tears because I found band-aids that matched my skin tone. And I think that that's a perfect example of how whiteness is seen as the baseline. It's seen as the norm mm -hmm. in our society. And I think you, you mentioned something about in, in, in the hospitals speaking up when you hear things presented, when patients are presented. And so one of the things like that, that triggered for me was, when we present patients, we'll be like, oh, this is a 65-year-old woman with a history of blah, 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 who's here with blah. Now, if they're black, they'll be like, this is a 65-year-old black patient. Or they'll be like, I don't know if I should say black or African. Like, there's it's like, not sure if they should say black or African-American. There's um, discomfort. There may be whispering. But no one says this is a 65-year-old white woman. It's right. like, we assume that they're white until we're probably taught to say it for everyone. But in reality, I don't think that happens. Is that, is that something that you see? Yeah, so so actually, like, um, now we're being taught in the medical school to not say it at all unless okay. it's clinically relevant. So it's interesting, though, because usually we don't say it, but then naturally people want to say, like, oh, it's a Black patient, um, even though it's not clinically relevant. It's kind of, like, ingrained to, yeah. to say, like, oh, this person is different, you know, so let's highlight that. You, and, and, that's, and that's really fascinating considering so much of our of our genetic information is oh that's the alarm in my house oh. <laughs> um so much of our genetic information is the same so yeah yeah um that's that's such so it's, i like that they've they've switched that because it was mm -hmm. always that was always a thing what are some other ways you see little like um Microaggression, I don't know how you feel about the term microaggressions, because I know some people are like, they're all aggressions, just not micro them away, they're, they're aggressions, but right. what are some ways that you see systemic racism playing out in the healthcare system? What are some things that you even already, I mean, you've done work in the system before you started med school your first year, but what, what are some of the big things you see that are red flags and, and things that can, maybe a, a different question or a second part of the question is, is what, how can we change those things? Yeah. Um, so I can first speak from the perspective of uh, medical students who identify as folks from oppressed or marginalized identities traditionally. And one thing that I've experienced is when a patient says something problematic, like so a patient says, oh, you remind me of this black kid from, you know, such and such movie. And like, it's just inappropriate in the context of the visit. Right. And I feel like a lot of preceptors, they aren't taught to, they, they really don't know how to support the student in those, in those situations. And the same happens for um, medical students who identify as female and in the different comments and things like that that they have to deal with. And sometimes I think preceptors just, you know, move on just because they don't really know how to grapple with it and have that conversation with the medical student. So I think something that I would like to see in the future is more training on how to support students in these times of discomfort when a patient is saying something very problematic or violent, frankly, toward the medical student or toward someone on the medical team. Um, because it is true that, you know, we're taught to, to put the patient first and to do no harm, but what happens when that patient is doing harm unto you as a medical student or 
your provider. And I think that um, that might not even just be a medical student issue. That might be just something that providers have to deal with too when things are said in a problematic way. And it's it's hard to deal with these situations when most of the medical institution is filled with white men, frankly, who can't relate to the experiences of a lot of those who come from these communities or, or represent these populations. Um, so I think that's something that I would definitely like to see more of is training on how to support both providers, medical students in general, um, when, they're, when they encounter those types of challenging situations. What do you say when people say, oh, he's just old, he's, he's just, you know, he's too old to teach, Let's, he doesn't know any better. About like the stereotypical like 68 year old white male attending or a professor or whatever who may say things like, hey, is it okay if I tell you you look nice in that dress? Or, or you know, or, or comment, I haven't gotten racial comments, but, or, or, or the, the equivalent in racial comments. How do you, I'm sure I've heard a lot of times people say, oh, they're just old. How do you? Right, right, right. I mean, I, I don't think that, I think it's a way for us to, when we say like, oh, they're just old, it's a way for us to not deal with the, the core issue. I think that sometimes, like for me, when someone might say something problematic, there are moments when I just decide to just keep on pushing. Because if I decided to grapple with and talk to and deal with every person, then that would destroy my energy. So I always try to decide what's going to be best for my energy in this moment. Mm -hmm. But I think in general, when we just say, oh, they're old, they can just say that it's fine. Then those same individuals are teaching medical students. So what's going to end up happening is they're going to perpetuate this message that it's okay to say these things because, and we're basically affirming their, their position in this power structure because it's, it's like they, they get to pretty much do whatever they want to do. And, and those below them have to deal with that. And I think it's really painful when people say, Oh, they're just old. That's how it is. If they're just old, that's just how, that doesn't mean that that's the correct way. It doesn't mean that it's right. And I think that we have a duty to say, no, this isn't the way that things should be done. And I think as institutions, they, they need to decide what side you're going to be on because you can't push and, and preach a, a, a diversity mission statement over here. And then on the other hand, you have practitioners and providers and leaders and faculty members who are doing damage to those individuals that you attracted to your institution with this exact same mission statement. Absolutely. I agree. I'm still working on ways to speak up in a way that isn't like, that's like, not too aggressive. <laughs> right, right. And it's I'm tough. Really good at like speaking up now, but I'm, I sometimes just get like a little too excited. And I like just for me to even not just, for me to not shut up, I think is a victory. For me to be speaking up is a, is a victory, but then, but then doing it in a way that it's heard and not right. and more right. is a, is a like picking and choosing the battle. Like, like what, and that's something I've had to learn too. Cause I also was on the, on the side of the spectrum where I was just like, I'm just going to speak up every single time something's wrong and, and that's it. And for some people that might be effective, but I found that it's sometimes about taking a step back and reflecting on how the person on the other side of your message is best going to receive it. Mm -hmm. And once you figure that out, it's, it's, it's almost more powerful because it depends on what exactly you're trying to get out of this interaction. If it's, you just want to raise hell, raise hell. But if you're trying to, you know, make, steps forward towards some type of goal that you have then sometimes it's better to take a step back and say okay how should I best go about this and I think the challenging part about um, the medical institution is how hierarchical it is and as a medical student you kind of are at the bottom of that hierarchy so you have to pick and choose your battles and and pick and choose your allies and who you're going to confide in about certain things because you got to also also protect yourself. And I think that's the really challenging part about this. For sure. For sure. And it's not only hierarchical, it's patriarchical. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it is the patriarchy. I feel there's a lot of, I haven't really like delved into this too much publicly, but I feel there's a lot of similarities between the healthcare system and society in general, in terms of the way that certain people are set up to succeed and certain people are set up to fail and the way it kind of uses power in this paternalistic way to n not for good a lot of a lot of times um mm -hmm. so i see a lot of very similar qualities in in healthcare so it's it's lovely to know that there are people 
um, coming through who are, because I look back at the way I was and I was perpetuating it. I didn't know it. None of it was like, yeah, hateful, but it was just fully ignorant. And I, I, I'm sh- quite sure I was making mistakes all the time with my patients and maybe some of my trainees. And I wish I could go back in time, but I can't, but, but consciousness is evolving on these issues, I believe. Um, which brings me to my next question and something that, that I wanted to talk about with you. What do you, what do you see, um, what has COVID brought to light for you about healthcare um, uh, inequality? And what do you want to be our lasting lessons from? All right, we're back. We just we're talked back. about a little bit. We're recording still. Zoom is like powering through. Yes. <laughs> We've gotten cut off twice, but it keeps recording. Um, okay, so did you hear my question? I did not hear your question. My question was, what do you think that COVID has brought to light um, about um, systemic racism and healthcare disparities? And what would you like to be the ongoing lessons that people take from this? Um, moving forward. Ooh, yes. So there are so many things that COVID-19 has brought to the forefront. Um, I think that so many different issues about healthcare equity, healthcare access, um, the way that having access to um, safe living conditions, I mean, just everything is, is really brought up. And I think um, the first interesting thing that COVID-19 has brought up for me is this idea of essential workers and how it's brought up who is considered essential right now and who previously was considered essential. So we know that majority of those who are bus drivers, who are working at uh, food, at, at restaurants and in food services, um, those who are mail carriers, all of these individuals who were previously considered um, blue collar, like my grandfather, he's a truck driver, and I wrote a piece about how he's considered essential. Um, suddenly, those are the individuals who are recognized as keeping our society going, and they always have kept our society going. And I think that it's been so interesting to see that when we've developed policies saying, okay, um, we need to socially distance, you need to make sure that you're washing your hands for X amount of seconds who is able to comply and carry out those mandates that are, that are issued. And the, the community that I immediately thought about are those who are incarcerated. We know that there are so many folks, um, predominantly people of color, Black and Latinx folks who are incarcerated for um, nonviolent offenses. And those individuals, they're, they're sitting in these cells, they're, they're in these em- environments where it's nearly impossible to for them to really socially distance. They definitely socially isolate because we've heard about stories about how bad isolation can be when folks you know, don't behave well or whatever the case is um, and, and the traumatic effects that, that has on the brain. But I think those individuals, also those who are on Native American reservations and who have been denied access to uh, fresh water sources and um, access to food. I mean, just so many different ills that, that we've seen as a result of government inaction and, um, and, and action that has been negative for these populations, where we're seeing all that play out. And I think that that has been especially interesting in addition to how people of color are those who are keeping our society running and they have to go to work. And they're also those who are, um, those who are dying most from COVID-19, those who are being infected at disproportionate rates of COVID-19. And I think really what this virus has shown us is, and I think it's something that I've always known, but I hope that now people can really get it, is public health and history and sociology is so critical for understanding medicine because even though a virus is a virus, the way it gets transmitted is going to follow certain social patterns. Mm-hmm. And I think that in the United States, those social, those social patterns are relegated by historical wrongs and policies that have been implemented by our country. And I feel like that's really what's being shown right now. And I think the other interesting trend has been seeing how uh, rates of domestic violence and sexual assaults and all of these other ills have increased as well because of folks being in quarantine. And I think in addition to that, we've seen those who are homeless, 
who basically are just kind of, you know, getting tested for COVID-19 and that's about it. And they're not really being treated um, the way that they should be. And we know that black folks, they are 40% of our homeless population, even though we're only 13% of the population um, overall in, in the US. So all of these different issues and homelessness is so deeply um, related to uh, being incarcerated and being considered a felon and your access to jobs and, and getting a home. And I think everything is connected. I wish that like I could create a concept map of how all these things are coming right. together. But I think really what COVID-19 is doing is, is, is just exacerbating all of those issues. And I think if we would have had the social infrastructure to support these communities from the very beginning, we recognize that everyone deserves access to healthcare and everyone deserves access to something like a stimulus check because of, um, of the inability for some folks to acquire intergenerational wealth because they weren't able to buy homes and, and, and things of that sort. I think that if we consider those things earlier on, then a lot of people wouldn't be in this, in this unfortunate position that they're in today. Right. Yeah, I love that. That's so well said. Um, and, and this notion that it's like, oh, well, it's because of the poverty. No, 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 right, right. Not. there is poverty, but why the poverty? The poverty is the symptom. It's not the disease. Um, and, and the systemic nature of racism is, is the disease. So, um, so what do you want, what do you want people? What, what's, what's, I guess, what do you want to avoid? What are the pitfalls of this whole, like, like mild awakening that, that people are having now about what, what COVID is bringing to light? What do you, what do you, what do you want to make sure doesn't happen? And, and what do you want to see happen in terms of change? Yeah, um, this is something I've reflected on quite a bit. And, and before I get into that, I just want to say that I hope that people see also with COVID-19 that you, it's not like a, if they build it, they will come situation with a lot of communities of color because there have been so many historical wrongs that have been committed by the medical institution mm -hmm. on black people and therefore thus they do not trust the medical system so even if you built a clinic in the middle of compton and you staffed it with the best ucla doctors people aren't just going to come because they don't necessarily trust the medical system and then i think also there's been this traditional erasure of black pain and we saw it with the opioid epidemic and why black folks were not prescribed opioids at the rate of white folks and in the end it did lead to less overdoses in, in during that time frame. I think that what that reveals to us is that people think, or whether that's some consciously or actively, that black people don't feel pain the same as white folks. And they've done studies of residents who said that they thought that black people felt pain at a lesser rate compared to white people. I mean, you can look them up. And I think that all of these things are so important to consider when we think about who's getting tested, who is dying disproportionately from COVID-19. And, and that shows us that in addition to the systemic, there's also this individual um, racism that we're seeing play out as well. And I think that that's a perfect example of that. And I think that what I hope is all of the points that I bring up that these things are talked about beyond COVID-19. I've heard a lot of people say, I can't wait until things go back to normal. And I wonder, why do we want things to go back to normal and, and who was benefiting from the normal? And I hope that when we have that conversation, that it isn't just something that's at the tail end of a presentation for medical students, for nursing students, for PA students. We need to make sure that that is at the forefront and constantly something that we return back to because COVID-19 is, is really hurting certain populations in this country and those are the same populations who have always been hurting and i think that if we make the mistake and make this solely an issue of virus transmission we're going to lose the opportunity to really make our world a better space for everybody to live in because if it doesn't happen now i i, I quite frankly don't know when it's going to happen for us to have this awakening because our world is just falling apart in a way and it's like flipping upside down and the the health disparities are right in our face and if we look at this and we say oh well that's just a poverty issue or oh that's just the way things are in america we're gonna we're gonna really miss out on a huge opportunity to to make a difference and do better and that's really disheartening yeah it's not like a a little quote next to a picture in a history book 
it's 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 a it's a should be an agent for change um and it's we're the world is lucky to have people like you who are who are speaking and, and, and speaking out and advocating I, I i didn't plan to ask you this but you mentioned so many books um that you read that were pretty seminal for you can you list five books that everyone should read if they want to learn more about uh racism mm, um so i would say uh the New Jim Crow by Michelle Alexander is, is a really big one. Um, I would say The Color of Law by Richard Rothstein is great for understanding um, the history of redlining and, and how that came to be. I would say Ghost in the Schoolyard by Eve Ewing. Um, she talks about the closing of Chicago schools. I believe it was in 2013 or it might have been um, earlier or maybe like two, one, so somewhere in the 2000s, but it's a really good book because she talks about how that impacted youth in Chicago and specifically black youth and why those decisions were made and, and how all that played out. And I found it to be um, a great read and really profound. Um, I would say The Warmth of Other Sons by Isabel Wilkerson is a great read as well because it talks about the great migration that, that happened um, in the 1900s and it really explains why u.s cities look the way they do and how black people ended up out of the south and into the north and really black folks were escaping genocide almost on the south because they or in the south because they were just being um it, it was just terrible the experiences that they were having there so i would say that is that is something that really has impacted me um and then for the last one, I will say Evicted by Matthew Desmond is really good um, because it explains housing inequity and homelessness and how all of that is connected to racism and how landlords have so much power and who gets to live, who gets to stay and how your ability to stay and live is connected to um, your, your record and it's, it's, it's a really um, interesting read. So I feel like all those together, and there's so many others too, but I feel like um, those were some of the reads that really helped me, you know, consolidate, integrate, and just understand the world around me. Awesome. How can people pick up what you're putting down? How can people find you? I know Twitter. Yeah. Um, or do you have a website? Are there projects that you're working on that people can check out? Or, or I know your, your project is medical school, so I understand. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yes, um, I'll be posting Zoom videos of me studying. <laughs> um, but but yeah, if you want to like keep up with all the things that I'm up to, um, I do have a website, LashiraNolan.com, and I post all of my latest. Um, I, I do a lot of op-ed writing, so I post all my pieces there. Or any places that I'm speaking, this will be up on the website too once we get the link. And then on Twitter, that's like usually where I kind of have all my musings about social justice in the world and I kind of throw different articles and things that I've been looking at but I think Twitter has been a great learning space for me and a great healing space as well because there's so many other folks out there who relate and care about these experiences and we kind of all come together and and support one another so so yeah but definitely shirenolan.com and, and Twitter that's where you can find all the latest things that's awesome there was there's one tweet of yours that i just want to read it was it's so beautifully uh written and profound hold on i took a screenshot of it you said this was uh four days ago some say med students should focus on biomedical research but i think every single one of my classmates should know a community seven miles away from our school has one of the highest transmission rates of covid19 in the country health equity is medicine and it's a new york times article about this neighborhood that has um, such a high transmission rate. So um, that's the kind of amazing stuff you're gonna <laughs> you're gonna get um, access to if you follow Lash on on Twitter. Um, thank you so much for taking the time to talk with me um, and to to share your insights. And I'm just love your energy and, and love everything you're bringing to the world. And I wish you um, all the luck. I, there's like. I can't wait to see what you do. I mean, you're already doing so much. You're doing more than most people accomplish by the time they're 80, but <laughs> you have a lot more time and I can't wait to see what you accomplish. And I can't wait to, you know, if you 
can't wait to vote for you for president or whatever it is that you decide oh, to do. You, I can't <laughs> wait to help support it in any way I can. Um, so again, thank you so much. Good luck. Would you have exams coming up soon? Yeah, we have a quiz uh, next Friday. We have like a quiz every two, three weeks. So, and that's just your like quiz sounds like not that big a deal, but this is a, a test on three weeks of work and then there's no, yeah. Final. And then we have like a final and that's like the big kahuna. Yeah. Okay. When's the final? The final isn't until like June. Oh, okay. So you've got a little bit of time. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Good luck. I do not envy you the studying. <laughs> You're like, I am done. I do not, I do not envy you that. Um, but uh, I think you're amazing. And uh, Harvard's so lucky to have someone like you in the, in the, have you there at all, but to have you in such a position of leadership uh, and your, your classmates and everyone that you're around uh, are going to benefit so much from, from knowing you. So thank you again. Have a wonderful weekend. And um, I look forward to, to following you. All right. Thank you so much. It's been an absolute pleasure. And I look forward to keeping up with you and all your important insights on meditation and all that good stuff, because that's something I could definitely benefit from as many other medical students. So awesome. awesome. Well, we, I'll, we, we can talk about that offline. I can talk about that all day long. All right. Thanks, Flash.